uh, dear Kevin, it's a great pleasure to not to have you, but to see you with a bird, with a bird, which is something new, apparently. It's my, uh, it's my attempt at Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> So I would like to, to thank you very much. We, we would have preferred to have you with us, but it was not possible uh, the, this time. I just remind our friends that you are uh, very well known, of course, as a former Prime Minister of Australia. I, and I say about Australia in the uh, Australian way. Uh, and uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs also of Australia, that you are uh, currently the president of the uh, Asia Society Institute, and, uh, uh, and that you are one of the most famous uh, experts on China. So uh, I am going to give you immediately the floor. We want to listen to your views uh, on uh, the political... Uh, situation in China and the interface between domestic politics and uh, international affairs. We just had the panel on uh, Asia, a general panel with different views on what uh, China is up to and what uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, what kind of leader Xi Jinping is and uh, what are his uh, goals, uh, uh, foreign policy goals in the short, medium to long term. Now the floor is yours and we are eager to listen to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thierry. Um, and you are from France? Or did I say from France? <laughs> if I'm from Australia. Very good. <laughs> thank you. Um, Thierry, let me spend, say, 10 to 15 minutes on one question, which is, uh, what is Chinese domestic politics looking like between now and the 20th Party Congress at the end of uh, 2022? Secondly, what does Chinese economic policy look like in that period, given all the recent publicity about a return to socialism? And then thirdly, what does this mean for the long-term trajectory of Chinese foreign policy and strategic policy? So why don't I try and spend, if it's okay with you, five minutes on each of those, and then let's have a discussion. On uh, Chinese domestic politics, I think it's fair to say that Xi Jinping has moved the center of gravity of the Chinese Communist Party further to the left during his um, nine years in office. Um, we see this, of course, in terms of the reassertion of the centrality of the Communist Party in every element of Chinese governance and in Chinese life. We see it also with uh, the assertion of himself as the supreme leader within the Communist Party. And we also see it in terms of uh, a range of crackdowns against his political opponents uh, through a series of Maoist-style uh, party rectification campaigns uh, of the type which Mao used way back in Yan'an uh, in uh, 1942. And this, together with the anti-corruption campaign, has been the means by which he has sought to eliminate any political opposition against himself from within the leadership echelons of the party. And so, as a consequence, if you look at the combined impact of these measures over the last uh, nine years, uh, it is quite a different set of Chinese politics now than we had very much at the end of the uh, Hu Jintao period uh, in uh, November of 2012. Of course, one of the reasons why Xi Jinping is doing that is uh, ideological. Uh, Xi Jinping, as I've said to many analysts, uh, is fundamentally a Marxist-Leninist. Um, and uh, as a consequence, he will not ultimately tolerate uh, any uh, diversity of view which undermines the centrality of the party's position as the Leninist vehicle of the Chinese revolution. And so in other words, he is contracting the private space for dissent, political dissent. He's contracting the space for, let's call it, the entrepreneurial class in the private sector. 
Uh, he's also, as it were, contracting the space for what you can do in your normal lifestyle. There have been, for example, new restrictions on the uh, gay and lesbian community in China. There's now new uh, restrictions on <clears throat> the number of computer games that you can play and when you can play them and what their content should be. Uh, so ideology and the central role of the party has been a principal motivation for this move to the left. But this is also individual and political, and that is that he seeks to uh, acquire the um, um, re-election of himself as China's uh, General Secretary uh, at the 20th Party Congress and reappointment as China's president the following March. Uh, that's all about 12 months from now. So there is quite an intensive political campaign by him against any would-be opponents to that extension of his term in office, a period in office which he would like to see extended, in my judgment, through to about 2035. Um, I said I'd also address where Xi Jinping is going on the economy. Parallel to what I just said, Thierry, um, the move to the left on the Chinese um, political spectrum has been matched by a move to the left on Chinese economics. We've seen this um, in both the ideological domain and the new configuration of concepts of China's new development concept as a replacement concept for reform and opening. Uh, we've seen it in China's new doctrine of the dual circulation economy, which is code language for greater national economic self-sufficiency and self-reliance and less dependency on the international market. And thirdly, we've also seen it in the contracting space uh, for the private sector and a reassertion of the role of the state and enterprise sector. And as part of that, a new uh, domain for Chinese industry policy, that is state intervention in driving the new mega corporations of the future in the new technologies of the future. And so all these shifts have occurred at much the same time as we've seen those unfolded in politics. Although the move to the left on the economy did not start back in 2013, in fact, we've seen them intensify since 2017. So what are the motivations for that? Once again, it's ideological. Xi Jinping wants to see the reassertion of the party state. Uh, he does not like uh, Chinese billionaires becoming the role models for China's uh, youth for the future. Uh, he also believes to hold on to power, he must see bigger wealth redistribution to China's uh, uh, lower uh, working classes and its uh, lower middle classes. Uh, he also um, believes that uh, this is all necessary in order to deliver the long-term realization of uh, his uh, national ambition for China to become a global superpower by 2049. And he believes that that can only happen as a consequence of um, the state driving this. Of course, the problem with this shift in the economic model from 35 years of reform and opening to what Xi Jinping now calls the new state, uh, new national development concept, driven by a more uh, greater reliance on the party state within the middle of it rather than the private sector, is whether this whole model and experiment will work or not, or whether we will as a result see China's animal spirits having been crushed and whether its economic growth numbers will start to come down. And right now we are in this um, process of, uh, of change <clears throat> and it's too difficult to predict how it's going to land. Uh, this new direction was articulated most clearly in the 14th five-year plan, which was promulgated by the party in the country in March of this year. Um, and uh, much of what I've just described is articulated in the pages of that plan, which of course is then taken down to the provincial and sub-provincial level. But given the private sector represents 60% of GDP and represents uh, some 90% of all Chinese innovation, uh, and of course, 80% of all China's uh, employment generation. There is a question as to whether this move to the public sector, move to the state-owned state enterprise sector, move to the industry policy uh, drivers of China's guided market model now, 
um, the real question uh, lies as to whether this will in fact backfire. And we don't have that yet. The last thing I wanted to spend um, four or five minutes on at TFE uh, is what does all this mean in terms of China's uh, foreign policy and strategic policy? Uh, if I could put my summary position as a bit like this, Xi Jinping has taken Chinese politics to the left for the reasons I've explained. He's taken economic policy more recently to the left for the other reasons I've explained. But at the same time, he's taking Chinese nationalism to the right. Um, and the reason for that is that it is a reflection of his desire to have a more assertive Chinese foreign policy, uh, his desire to realize more foreign policy goals in the short to medium term rather than the medium to long term. Uh, but also because uh, Xi Jinping realizes that domestic nationalism provides another pillar for domestic political legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party as well. Political legitimacy in the past for the Communist Party, given they don't have elections, uh, proceeds from three pillars. One uh, is traditional Marxist-Leninist ideology within uh, the party and all 95 million members of the party. Um, and it's the internal, as it were, orthodoxy, the internal language of orthodoxy and practice of that orthodoxy. Uh, which uh, provides legitimacy in the eyes of the party for its continued role, and also those who would voluntarily support the party's ideological mission. The second pillar of orthodoxy, though, in the Deng Xiaoping period, given the party ideology collapsed after the Cultural Revolution, uh, was uh, what happened with Deng's economic transformation of the last 35 years. And the new pillar for legitimacy was prosperity. And that as prosperity rose, not just for the country, but for individuals within it. And so the Communist Party was seen as, de seen as delivering the goods. However, um, the third pillar of legitimacy has been nationalism and rising Chinese national power. And the assertion of that uh, power, particularly against the United States, also against Japan, but also against other members of the so-called West. Um, this is becoming more important as a pillar for legitimacy, as a question mark begins to arise over China's slowing economic growth rate, uh, the um, actions taken against the Chinese entrepreneurial class, uh, and whether in fact the economic miracle of the last 35 years may begin to slow down and deliver less in the future than it has in the past. That makes nationalism more important. So what does it mean in practice, uh, Thierry? And I'll conclude on these comments. It means that um, in the next decade, assuming Xi Jinping is reappointed, we will see a progressively more assertive China over Taiwan, over the South China Sea, over the East China Sea, over its policies with its 14 neighboring countries. Uh, also, you'll see a more assertive Chinese international economic policy. Uh, you'll also see a more assertive position by China in the international rules-based order. And China seeking to enhance its position within uh, the UN system, within the Bretton Woods machinery, but also with new multilateral institutions which China itself creates. Where will that land us by the end of the decade? I think uh, we should not anticipate any early move by China against Taiwan, not because China has eschewed the use of force, but because China believes that the balance of power will be more to its advantage against the United States by the end of the decade rather than the beginning of the decade. Similarly with the South China Sea and similarly with both Japan and the US in the East China Sea. Um, so I do not see, as it were, immediate flashpoints uh, in the next year or two in, either, in any of these important theatres, but I do see uh, flashpoints emerging toward the end of the decade as the balance of power slowly changes unless the Americans, of course, can arrest uh, that balance of power and partnership with its allies in this part of the world. So Thierry, having spoken now for just under 15 minutes on Chinese politics, the economy, uh, nationalism and its impact on Chinese foreign and strategic policy, uh, I'm happy to take any questions you may have following those remarks. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Kevin, for this extremely uh, clear statement. I have two simple questions for you. 
The first one is, uh, is the economic political model of China. I say economic political because politics, the party is everywhere. Is it viable from an economic viewpoint in the long term? It's a very important question because if the answer is positive, it would mean that the Western capitalist uh, approach to economics or to economic development would not be the only possible one. And that would be the first time in uh, modern history that we have a real alternative model. The Soviet Union failed because of its incapacity to solve the economic problem within its political framework. So uh, do we have, uh, or do you have some clear views on these very basic questions? That's my first question. And I put the second question at the same time because we are interrelating inter here politics and uh, foreign policy, domestic and foreign policy. My second uh, question is something we have briefly discussed in the previous one. And it is the following. Uh, the traditional strategic, the, the traditional Chinese approach to strategy is in the Sun Tzu uh, spirit, that is to win uh, without having to wage a war, okay? And in that sense, uh, strategic passion, patience could be enough to resolve the Taiwan problem because uh, over the long term, uh, strategic patients sh patients should be enough. But on the other hand, it is the fact that Xi Jinping stated a number of times clearly, openly, that the Taiwan problem would be solved during his mandate. So, Nobody knows exactly how long his mandate will be, but if we take him to its words, it means that in the next few years, he wants to have solved the Taiwan problem. So there is a, some kind of contradiction. And my question to you is how do you explain that uh, Xi Jinping took the risk of being so assertive and so precise in terms of time framework about Taiwan. Okay, thank you, Thierry. Let me take those in sequence. I think um, on the question of whether the economic model will work, um, the honest answer is the jury is out. But you are right to say this, this is a very large gamble by Xi Jinping that China has found a new path to development to overcoming the middle income trap without further liberalizing the economy and without liberalizing politics. In fact, within the economy itself, and you're right to call it the economic political model, uh, Xi Jinping has been quite explicit about his formulations on this. He has said that um, uh, China uh, is now uh, embraced on a period of um, a guided market economy. No longer market economy, not any longer a socialist market economy, uh, but a guided market economy. It's a new term. And the mechanism for the guidance, for example, uh, is the massive injection of uh, industry guidance funds into the economy, driven by state and enterprises, against the strategic definition of core innovation-driven industry sectors for the future. Now, you are from uh, La Belle France, and I know well the importance of l'État uh, within uh, the French uh, economic development model. But uh, this is uh, something which is 10 times as big in scale uh, and in relative scale against anything which uh, our friends in France would have experimented with before. And it's to be driven by state-owned corporations. 
So it's big. They conceive it as being different. They see it as uh, also uh, a, the third phase in China's socialist model evolution, uh, the failures of the pre-78 period, uh, the capitalist excesses of the post-78 period, and now the moderation into the Xi Jinping period uh, into a guided market economy with greater common prosperity. Of course, in Europe and the West, we're familiar with the whole debates around the, the troisième voie, uh, in terms of capitalism and social democracy uh, and, and socialism. But this is different because the debates in the West between capitalism, socialism and social democracy um, were within a liberal political system, a democratic political system. And this is within an authoritarian political system. The only thing I'd say by way of definitive analysis uh, of whether it will succeed or not um, is those who are our most active students in the international community today of China's economic development model. People like um, Nick Lardy um, at uh, the Peterson Institute in Washington and Barry Norton, uh, who I think uh, is uh, out of Berkeley in the United States, West Coast, uh, in um, San Francisco. If you read carefully what they have written the last 12 months, they are skeptical about whether this can work. And neither of these um, scholars, and they are scholars, and they're not polemicists and they're not um, uh, classic think tankers as such. They are analysts of the Chinese economy. They are skeptical as to whether Xi Jinping uh, can continue to generate the productivity growth necessary to actually engender long-term sustainable economic growth in China to break through the middle income trap without China falling victim to the economic and financial burden of an aging population, a shrinking population, and a shrinking workforce participation rate. Um, so that's my attempt at answer at the first question. I'll be very brief on the second. On Taiwan, I do not think Xi Jinping um, wants uh, to uh, go to war over Taiwan uh, anytime soon. I think he's highly cautious. You just referred to Sun Tzu Bing Fa. Uh, Article 1 in the Art of War, uh, which Sun Tzu wrote, um, Thierry says, war is a great matter of state which must be studied carefully because if you lose a war, you lose the state. <laughs> now, for those reasons, that is etched into the cerebral cortex of most Chinese leaders. And as a consequence, they take a highly cautious approach to the conduct of war. Therefore, Xi Jinping intends, in my judgment, to be political leader of China through until 2035. Um, and by that stage, he'd be 82 years old, still younger than Deng, before Deng retired from active politics at around about the age of 87. So for those reasons, I suspect that his career planning personally uh, and the strategic patience necessary to engender a bigger balance of power advantage for China during the course of this decade would still enable him to threaten and, if necessary, take military action, say, by the end of this decade or early in the 2030s, to achieve his objective with much greater certainty of success than were that to be the case any time soon. I'll leave my comments there. Thank you very much. Sir.